Secret of the Indian by Lynn Reed Banks. Chapter 6, A New Insider. Emma, what, what are you doing there? But it was only too obvious what she was doing. She was looking and listening. The only question was, how much had she seen and heard? In a forlorn and desperate hope, Omri swiveled his eyes sideways, trying to see what was visible from her angle. Before, when he'd been crouching in front of the desk, he had blocked her view of the seed tray. Now that he was on the floor, everything was in plain sight. Matron's little figure, standing arms akimbo, on the edge of the seed tray, little bear's pony, grazing in the miniature paddock Patrick had made, several tiny Indians busy about the area, rebuilding last night's fire from the unburned end of matchstick with matchsticks and twigs, and the longhouse rising from the ground in all its miniature, and all its minute handmade magnificence. But Emma was not looking as far as that. On the low table that stood between her and Omri was the cupboard and the five Indians. They were chanting and doing a slow dance around the white paper packet. It was upon them. Omri saw that Emma's eyes were riveted. There was nothing to be done. Not zilch. zippity doo da zero. And when that's the case, thought Omri in a sudden mood of fatalism, you might as well relax. Well, he said, his voice coming out quite steady, what do you think? She stared at them for a long time, her eyes fixed and unblinking, her freckles standing out on a, sudden very, on a suddenly very pale face. They're alive, she said at last in a doubtful tone, as if he might roar with laughter at her. "'You don't say,' said Omri, scrambling to his feet. "'And not only these, what about these here?' he indicated the seed tray behind him. Emma moved cautiously forward, as if afraid the very floor might waver and give way beneath her feet. He noticed now that she had a mug of tea, that she had a mug of tea in her hand, the one he'd saved from breakfast. It might have been the excuse she'd given herself for, for following him up. It tilted in her, in her nerveless fingers.' and he removed it safely. As he poured a few drops into a toothpaste cap for Matron, Omri watched Emma as she gazed and gazed. He knew that what his father called a quantum leap had been taken in the situation, the sort of change that means nothing will be quite the same again, and that was scary, but there was no denying a sort of enjoyment in watching someone else seeing, trying to realize, coming to grips with it. Emma managed this last feat surprisingly quickly. I've always thought it could happen, she said abruptly. It often nearly has when I've been playing with my toys, with my toy animals. Can they talk? Of course they can. That's who you were talking to, Matron's voice, little but scratchy as chalk on a blackboard, chirped in. And who, pray, might this young person be? I don't believe we've been introduced, Emma turned, a, a suddenly flushed and smiling face on Omri. Wow, Omri, what fun, how fantastic, I mean, how brill can anything get? Yeah, said Omri somewhat sourly, brill, except in that little hut there are some men who are wounded, and who could die if we don't do something, and they're real. I'm responsible for them, and Patrick's P.O.'d. P.O.'d about, P.O.'d, what's that? Uh, gone, and gone where? Omri took a deep breath. It's no time to explain everything, there's no time to explain everything now, listen. You know that set of plastic figures Tabson got for her birthday? Emma was one jump ahead of him, her face lit up another few watts. Yes, yes, I got one too. You mean we can make them all come alive, be real like these? Omri grabbed her arm. Wait, did you say you got the same set of models as Tabson? She shook her head. Don't pinch. No, mine was different. Mine was a sort of shop with people in trolleys and checkouts, and Omri's heart sank. Not doctors. She shook her head. No, I wanted doc doctors and all that, but Tam wouldn't swap. Omri said, would she sell hers? Got the odd hundred quid, have you? said Emma cynically. I've got the odd five quid, Emma frowned, considering. She might not be able to resist. She's saving for a skiing holiday. Patrick's got another fiver, said Omri. I could. He turned automatically toward the chest, then stopped. Uh, listen, Em. I'm prepared to let you in on most of this. Well, you are in on it, but there's a couple of wrinkles that you might not exactly feel comfortable about. Not just at first. So would you mind going downstairs for a few minutes? Then I'm going back to your place with you, and we'll negotiate for the models with Tam, she hesitated. And then come back here and 
do whatever it is you do to make them come alive, Omri looked at her. Now she knew about the little people. She didn't yet know about the magic, how to make it happen. She didn't really know much when you came right down to it. There wasn't a lot she could give away, not that anyone would believe. And that was the nitty-gritty, not her knowing, but her maybe telling. Could he trust her? Could one trust anyone with a secret as exciting as this? We'll have to have a serious talk, he said, on the train. Just now, I want you to go out. Please, Em. They looked at each other. He actually saw her decide to give way, whether to please him or for reasons of her own, he wasn't sure. It didn't matter anyway. Anyhow, just so she went. The second she was outside, he shot the bolt and made sure that he rushed to the cupboard, took the key out, stuck it back in the chest, and turned it. Patrick lay curled up as Omri had seen him once before, and he remembered his thought the other time. As far away as you can get without being dead. It was tempting to stand there, losing himself in the speculation about where the real Patrick was. But there was no time for such thoughts. Reaching into the chest, Omri fumbled in Patrick's pocket for the five-pound note and touched something that made him snatch his hand away with a yelp as if he'd burned it. There was something alive in Patrick's pocket. Omri stood there with his heart in his gullet. It wasn't a person. It was a tiny animal of some kind with fingertips. Omri... With his fingertips, Omri felt that much. Patrick must have had something plastic in his pocket, and when he was locked in the chest, it had come to life. Cautiously, Omri stuck his fingers into the pocket again. Yes, there it was, something small, smooth-coated, and bony. He took hold of it gently as he could, and feeling it struggle and twist, he drew it out. It was a very distressed black horse, complete with an old Western-style saddle and bridle. Boone's horse, his new one, that Patrick had taken from the English soldier, Omri set it down very gently in the paddock on the seed tray, where Little Bear's pony was tethered with a double-ply nylon thread. It threw up its head as the intruder descended from the heavens and whinnied anxiously, but as soon as the black pony's feet were on the ground and it had given itself a good shake, both their heads dropped to graze the turf of real grass Patrick had dug up and laid there. Omri smiled in relief. Evidently, Boone's pony was all right, though he wished he could take off its bridle and saddle. Boone must have put his old tack on before Patrick had sent him back. Suddenly Omri went rigid, his brain fizzing with the shock of the realization that had come to him. But now, but how could they have been so stupid? In all the haste and hassle of getting Patrick sent back, they'd forgotten, forgotten the way it worked. Patrick had the plastic figure of Boone in his hand, not the real live Boone. That meant, that meant that Boone, like his Horace, would be have become real inside the chest. Boone, he called frantically in the depths of the chest. Boone, where are you? Are you okay? Silence. Omri grabbed Patrick's right arm. His hand was tucked under his body. Omri dragged it out from under Patrick's dead weight. The fingers were closed into a tight fist. Sticking out of the top was a tuft of ginger hair. Grimly, desperately, Omri pried Patrick's fingers open. In his hand lay Boone, the real Boone, limp, motionless, dead, crushed, Matron! Before he knew it, the stalwart lady had been snatched off the seed. Before she knew it, the stalwart lady had been snatched off the seed tray and set down, somewhat short of breath and dignity, on the low table. Not another patient. I've got more than I can. Then she saw her voice changed. Oh dear me, she said softly. Oh dearie, dearie me. With a doomful look, she fell to her knees beside the supine figure of Boone and applied her ear to his heart. To his horror. To his horror. Omri saw her, her give her head half a shake, and that's the end of chapter 6.